Let's turn our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 9. The book of Acts chapter 9. If you're taking notes this morning, you can tell this morning's message, Jesus the Christ heals you. Jesus the Christ heals you. Acts chapter 9. We're finally going to be done. This is our fourth week in chapter 9. And so we're going to focus in on this little section here. Let's real quick just read one scripture that I think is really important and is going to set the stage for our time together. Look at verse 34 with me, Acts chapter 9. It says that Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. If you have a pen, pencil, highlighter, in verse 34, would you underline that phrase, Jesus the Christ heals you. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together corporately as a family, as a body of believers, and worship you. And God, we pray now that as we study your word, that you would speak to our heart. Lord, I believe that there are some who came this morning who are in need of a touch from you. Lord, that there's some sort of healing that needs to take place in many lives in this room. And so, God, I pray that you would speak. I pray that you would minister. I pray that you would touch. And, Father, I thank you for that promise in Psalm where it says you sent your word and you healed them. And so, God, as you send your word out this morning, we pray that you would heal us of whatever it is that ails us. So, God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Jesus the Christ heals you. I believe that as we're assembled together in church as a body this morning, that there are many of us, every, every single one of us, in fact, that is in need of healing. Whether it's this morning, whether it was last week, whether it's in the months to come, I believe that within this room, every single one of us at some moment needs the hand of God to reach down and to touch us. I believe that as we go about life, whether it be physically, you know, there's sickness involved, or whether it be some sort of emotional thing that takes place in our life where we're completely devastated, heartbroken, whether we're here this morning and it's our past and there's all these things and the Lord just is trying to heal it and the enemy tries to re-bring it back up. Whether you've come here this morning and something's taken place and you're heartbroken. Whether you're here this morning and maybe there's some sort of strong addiction that you're trying to get past and you're just pleading with the Lord, Lord, would you heal me? Or maybe you've come here this morning and there's a relationship involved. Maybe there's a friendship involved. Maybe there's something between you and your spouse there within a marriage. Maybe you came here this morning and there's something going on in your home with you and your children. Maybe it's taking place in your workplace between you and an employer or an employee. Or maybe it might even be within this room this morning. There's some sort of broken relationship within the church body. Or maybe it might be where the place you left, that former pastor, that former leader, somebody, or maybe that former friend, but I believe that every single one of us in here can relate to needing a touch from God. I believe that every single one of us here can relate with, hey, Lord, I have this thing. I have this relationship. I have this addiction. I have this broken heart. I have this illness or sickness, and I need you to heal me. How about this one? I believe that we some of us need a touch from God when it comes to being healed of bitterness. You see, I think this one is probably the one that plagues the church more than any other. You see, this is the one that no one else can see. This is the one that's the most fake in church because somebody comes and says, hey, how you doing? And you're like, oh, I'm doing great. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. And yet you can't stand that person because what they said last week or what they said last time. You see, you hold on to things and yet you put on a front. 
You guys remember in Acts chapter or in Exodus chapter 15, as the children of Israel were making their way beyond to the waters of Mara. And as they got to the waters of Mara, they hadn't drank in a while. They were thirsty. They went to the waters of Mara. As they begin to sip from it, they realized that the water was bitter. You guys remember the story, right? And as they drank, it was like, this water is bitter. It's nasty. It's sick. I can picture them just spitting it out. And all of a sudden, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I always say that, don't I? One of my favorite verses in the Bible, I feel like I use that every week. But really, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, then the Lord showed Moses a tree. And the Lord said, I want you to go take that tree, cast it into the water. And so what did Moses do? He takes the tree, casts it into the water. And we're told that the water went from being bitter to what? Sweet. What did the Lord do? He healed, in a sense, the water. And it was at that moment in Exodus 15, 26, that the Lord said, I am the Lord who heals you. He says, I want to remind you, just as I was able to take the bitter water and make it sweet, I can take your bitter heart. I can take your bitter relationship. I can take your bitter marriage. I can take whatever is ailing your life. And by showing you a tree, by showing you a cross, and what Christ did upon the cross, he says we can toss it into the situation, toss the cross into the relationship, toss Jesus into the mess, and watch Jesus do a healing. And those of you that love the whole um, names of God in the Old Testament, it's there in Exodus 15 where we get the name Jehovah Rapha, or literally God my healer, because God took the water and he healed it, and he made it sweet. As we make our way to Acts chapter 9 this morning, we're going to notice that God is into healing things. So he's into healing marriages, he's into healing hearts, he's into healing bitterness, and specifically in our text this morning, God is into healing sickness. Would you guys begin with me there in verse 32? It says, now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. So here in our section, as we complete chapter 9, there are two little mini sections that we're going to take a look at. Those of you taking notes this morning, the first section that we're going to take a look at are verses 32 through 35, where Aeneas is healed. And this is the story that we find ourselves in. And those of you taking notes, the second section that's clearly probably outlined there in your Bible is verses 36 through 43, where Dorcas is restored. So here in verse 32, we're told that Peter went through all the parts of the country. And he makes his way down to a place called Lydda. And as he's there, he encounters some saints. Lydda was about 25 miles away from Jerusalem. And what I want you guys to notice for a minute is that there's a difference now in the church ministry. There's a difference now in the way that the apostles are serving the Lord. You guys remember back in Acts chapter 5 and as the Lord was beginning the church, what was taking place when it came, when it came to ministry and the apostles? What happened? Everyone came where? To Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 5 verse 16 it says, A multitude gathered from the surrounding cities, and where'd they go? To Jerusalem. Bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So let's stop for a second. So you're in another city. You're kind of off at a distance. Let's say you're here at Lydda. And you hear that over in Jerusalem, stuff is happening. There's, this, there's these guys that have been sent out by Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, and they're touching people. Healing is taking place. And so what do they do? They all jump in and they're like, we got to get over to Jerusalem. We have to make our way to them. And so there they are. They set up shop. There's now a home base and people are flocking to them. 
and people are bringing the sick. They're bringing those who have unclean spirits. And what's happening? People are being healed. Well, now as we get to chapter 9, it says that Peter is now no longer stationed in Jerusalem. What's he doing? He's making his way out. So the way that they did ministry, you, everybody come to us, is now changing. It's we're going to go out to them. You guys remember Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you're going to take this message, you're going to be witnesses to me, empowered by the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, but it's not meant to stay there. It's meant to be sent out into all the earth. And so now Peter, we see that he's making his rounds in a sense. He's going about, he's going out, we're told here in verse 32, into all parts of the country looking for opportunities to minister. And I just, I, I love this picture here. You see, it'd be like us saying, you know what, we're just going to sit here. I'm just going to stay glued to my hard metal seat and wait for opportunities to happen. You see, if this community wants to hear about Jesus, they need to come here. You know, they need to come here. I'm just going to sit in this seat and wait for things to happen. This is Jerusalem. This is home base. We're just going to stay here. I don't see anybody walking through the door. I don't think anything's going to happen. All right, let's just clean up and go. I mean, that, that, that's kind of the picture here, isn't it? It's like if something's going to happen, what do we need to do? We need to go where they are. We need to go, in a sense, about the country, about the area, about the community, and say, hey, I have something to share with you. And I don't expect you to come sit right here with me. I'm going to go to you. And that's a picture of what's taking place. Peter's like, hey, we're going to get out of Jerusalem, and we're going to head out into these other parts. But one of the things I'll tell you guys is if that's going to take place in our church, it takes a commitment. You see, it's really easy to say, I'll show up to church for a couple hours on Sunday and sit in my seat. But it's a whole other thing to say, hey, I'm going to take my Christianity, my relationship with God, and I'm going to live it 24-7 out there. And that's the relationship that people want to have with God when it's convenient for them. People want to have a relationship with God that, hey, if it fits with where my life is, if it fits with my plans, if it fits with my dreams and my goals and my family and my kids and what we want to do, then you know what? I guess I'll live it beyond Sunday morning. When Jesus, what did Jesus say? In Luke chapter 2, Jesus said, you guys remember they were looking for Jesus and they came. They're like, where were you? And Jesus said, hey, I was about my father's business. So Jesus said, hey, my life is not lived for me. My, live, my life isn't lived for what I want. My life isn't lived for my goals and my dreams and my aspirations and my hopes and what I'm trying to get to and what I'm trying to achieve. My life is lived for the Father's business. And so that's what Peter's doing. He's going about. He saw Jesus do it. And now what is he doing? He's duplicating it. He's imitating it. He's getting out there and doing what Jesus did. And so here, as Peter's going about, he's going to come in contact with a man that needs to be touched and healed. And he's like, hey, this is no big deal. I saw Jesus do it. Hey, this same scenario, it happened with Jesus. And so I think I'm going to try it. And I'll tell you guys, as we go through the word... As we study the scriptures, the whole heart, the whole point, the whole mentality, the whole goal is that we would do as Jesus did. Because if we're not going to do as Jesus did, then I don't get the point. If we're not going to live the way that Jesus lived, then I don't get why we're trying to do this whole Christianity thing. Because what's a Christian? A Christian is literally a little Christ. And so you and I, if you've ever seen... I know it's such a bad movie, but you ever seen Austin Powers and they had the little mini me running around? You had big me and you had little me. 
That's the same picture of what a Christian is supposed to be like. We have Jesus, and then we have little, little Jesuses. And we're running around, and we're supposed to be living the way that he lives. We're supposed to be loving the way that he loved. And so we're going about the earth. And so there's no point in being a Christian or calling ourselves Christ-like if we're not going to be, in a sense, little Christ. And Jesus was about his father's business. And I pray that we, too, would have that same heart. One of the things that I want to encourage us, just because I know that a lot of us are having children. We have children that are young, children that are little. I don't think that excludes us or those of you that have children, maybe in that age. I don't think it excludes you from serving the Lord. One of the things that I, that I really believe is that our kids need to see us serving the Lord. So it's not, oh, I have a baby or this is now my ministry. Yes, it is a ministry. God's entrusted those children to you. But it doesn't mean you pull back. It doesn't mean you do less. What it means is that you continue to be about your father's business. Last Sunday night, we were out here on the field. And people are coming to our table. Because Dan the man and Christy the whatever. she they, I can't think of anything, sorry. But they were out there and they were doing face painting. And they were out there and they, I mean, the week before we had... Kathy brought these little drawings, and so they're there, and Christina, some kid's like, I want to look like Spider-Man. I think it was my kid, but I want to look like Spider-Man. So Christina takes out her phone and Googles an image of Spider-Man, and she's like drawing. So Dad and Christina are like, we're going to step up the game, you know, for Coastline. So they brought stencils. And so, I mean, it was like, Dan's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it good. And so they, they brought stencils, and Christy's out there, you know, like, I mean, you know, typically, I mean, if you're going to paint a flower, you just take take the pink and make a pink flower. Chrissy's like doing like all sorts of color blends on there and I mean it was like amazing you know she was like a lady in a toenail shop you know just painting toenails blending colors and I mean it was I, it was just this and kids are lining up but this is the reason I share it. They're there. They're doing this together. They're about their father's business in a sense but what I really love was that Emma was just running around or not Emma Baby change her name? No, no. Eva was just running around everywhere. I think Emma was Dorcas, right? In bed about to die. And so yeah, Emma was just sick. Okay, so I mean, but Eva was just there running around. And they're painting faces, and Eva's, run, Eva's running around. You guys should have named your baby something different, okay? I mean, it's confusing to stop. Okay, so. So you, what are you guys having? You guys having a boy or a girl? A boy. You guys are having a what? So please don't name your kid like Nick and Rick or something, okay? Because this is going to throw me off, okay? So name your baby something different because then I'm going to mess them up later on like that, okay? So, but get the picture. They're there serving the Lord and Eva's running around just being crazy. And then every five minutes, it's like her things getting smeared and I'm like, Christy, come on, the other kids, you know, because Christy's not a bunch of them, but it's one of those things where it's like, there and they're serving the Lord and their daughter was a part of it. Reminds me of Joshua 24. You guys remember what they said? As for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. So as a family, we're going to serve the Lord. If we go on a mission trip, we're going to serve the Lord. I remember five years ago, Megan traveling around Peru with her as um, Robert and Kathy went on a mission trip and Back then, Megan was like a little tiny, annoying 11-year-old that the same stage Chloe is in now. But anyways, and so, and so I remember riding on the bus with her, and now I look at Chloe, I'm like, oh, it's Megan five years ago. But anyways, and so, but I just remember they took, and then Andy, you were part of there too, and Andy was traveling around with his dad doing missionary work, and I'm like, Lord, this is the way it's supposed to be. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be about our Father's business. And so Peter makes a decision. He says, we're not going to just sit here and wait for people to come. We're going to get out there where the people are. Reminds me, you guys remember the parable of the great banquet? Where it's, a, it's sort of a preview there of Revelation 21 and Revelation 19 as we one day are going to be part of that great banquet with the Lord. 
where he is going to be the groom and we're going to be the bride of Christ. In Luke chapter 14, we're told that this parable happened concerning the great banquet and the master of the house sent his servant out to go and find people to come to the banquet. And so he said this, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And it says in verse 22 of Luke chapter 14, Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there still is room. And so you see, the master goes and tells the servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. And so the picture is, hey, get out there and invite people to come. You see, one day there's going to be a wedding feast. And we want those people to be a part of it. We don't want them alienated from it. We don't want them going to hell rather than being a part of that. He says, get out there. Invite the poor, the lame, the crippled. He says, get out there into the highways, the byways, the alleys, the streets. Wherever they're at. The, who are they? The ones that don't know the Lord. The ones that at this moment wouldn't be a part of the wedding feast. And he says, compel them, ask them to come, listen, so that his house, so that heaven, so that the house of the Lord, the place where Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you, that where I go, you may be also. He says, so that place would be full. You see, what we don't want full is hell, do we? Man, we want to see hell just packed. No, 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 we don't want to see it packed. We want to see it empty. Where do we want to see full? Our Father's house. We want to see those rooms, those places that the Lord's prepared for us. We want to see those places filled. One of the things, I'm going to go back to this children thing and then we'll move on. One of the things the Lord showed me recently is I kind of stopped for a minute and I thought about this whole church thing and leaving South Bay and coming here. And one of the things I didn't realize that when we came was that I was bringing my kids with me. You know, it was just like, oh, I'm going to go do this thing, and Christina's on board, let's go. And yet when we got out here, we realized this wasn't just a me and Christina doing this kind of thing. I mean, we brought our kids into it. And I mean, and our kids, a couple of them had a really hard time, you know, because everything they knew was wrapped up in South Bay, and now you're making them leave and start a new work. And so just because mommy and daddy felt called to do it didn't mean kids were just going to tell, oh, this is so much fun. No, 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 it wasn't fun for them. And they hated it at first. I think one of them still hates it even now. I don't know, but it's just one of those things where it's like, but I look, and the Lord told me this, and this is maybe a word for some of us here. I felt like the Lord was like, I want you to stop looking at your kids as just, hey, these are my kids. And I just kind of drag them along with whatever daddy's called to do. I want you to look at them as your co-laborers in the gospel. Why? Because when we got out here, the one that hated it the most, Chloe. You guys know Chloe every Friday teaches a Bible club at her school? Elementary. See, I heard of high school Bible clubs, but I never heard of an elementary one. But she teaches the elementary Bible club every Friday. Now, me and Stephen can debate over whether her as a girl should be teaching men, and, you know, in that sort of setting, because, you know, but anyways, the, well, me and Stephen have had that conversation before, but, I mean, she teaches this Bible club on Fridays, and the Lord's like, I didn't just call you out here, I didn't just call your wife out here, I called your children out here, I called your children to minister, I'll tell you guys, those of you with young ones, you will not find a baby better babysitter than Christiana. You will not find someone who will love your little tiny one more than Christiana will love your little one. Why? Because God didn't call me and her out here. God didn't just call Chloe out here. God called Christiana out here. Now, why did God call Nathan out here? I don't know yet. I think God called Kaylee out here to sing. So, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust in that one. But I look and God's called the whole family. And so God's like, I want you to step out of where you're comfortable, and I want you to get out amongst where the people are. 
And so I want to encourage you guys in that area to include the children. Verse 33. It says, There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. I want you guys to notice here in verse 33 that now he goes as he's about his father's business, just like Jesus. What happens in verse 33? He finds an opportunity to minister. He finds a man, we're told, who had been in bed, bedridden for eight years. We're told that his problem is that he is paralyzed. And so we see Peter is now active. He's mobile in serving God. And so God is putting opportunities before him because he made himself available. Verse 34, it says, And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise, make your bed. And then he rose immediately. One of the things I want to notice here in verse 34 is who does the healing? Jesus. And so God can take someone like you or me and he can use us to go and pray for someone. And yet it's not us that does the healing. I remember when, we, when I was at South Bay, at least maybe three, four times a week, I'd sit in this little room doing marriage counseling. And so that was part of my job, part of my responsibility there. And people would come, and one of the things that would happen when they walk in is we'd sit down, and I'd introduce myself, and, and I'm like, okay, what happened? You know, who, 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 let's start with this. Whose idea is this? Because usually there's one person that called this meeting to order, and there's one person that dragged the other person along. And so, like, okay, who, who, whose fault, and who, you know, who, who's, who called? Well, I called. Usually it was a wife, you know. And so the wife's like, let me start. And so I'd listen. And so the end of her little speech, why they're there, would sound something like this. Well, you know, and he did this, and he did this, and he did this, and he did this, and he's this, and he's this, and he's not this, and he's this, and my dad was like this, and he's not like this. And, you know, I hear all these sort of things. And at the very end, it'd be like, okay, pastor, can you fix it? Or can you fix him? And I'm like, No. Especially the way that you describe them. I, I, I can't, I'm done. I'm going to change professions. You know, it's like I can't do nothing. But it was like, now can you fix it? And I was looking, I can't. But I know someone who can. And I think that's sometimes how the mentality is in church, isn't it? You come to church, you bring them to the pastor, here, fix them. I can't fix them. I mentioned in my prayer, my opening prayer in Psalms, the Bible says, he sent his word and his word did what? healed them. And so all I can do as a servant of God is give the word. And so I'd sit there and say, okay, let me tell you this. It has nothing to do with me. Nothing I can do for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the, well, why are we going to go through the Bible for? I, I mean, I, I want you to like fix it. I'm like, there's nothing I can do. You want me to get some duct tape and tape his mouth? I mean, so he'll shut up. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> But then you're going to get mad at him for not answering your questions. You know, it's just like, I, there's nothing I can do. All I can do is give you the word. And in the same way, when it comes to healing, it's Christ that does the healing. And so you might be here this morning and there's stuff going on in your marriage and you're like, man, when is this guy going to, you know, or who's going to help us or how? And it's Jesus that's going to do the healing. I remember... In Christina's family, they would call only when they need something. I mean, I, I, she, had, she had these cousins who, you know, they don't want to hang out. They don't really want to talk. But I'll tell you, the moment something happens, it's like, we're going to go talk to him. We're going to get over there. Why? Because, hey, there, there's, there's some sort of thought like, man, they, these people represent Jesus. They represent the Lord. And so I think it's a good thing if people say, hey, I got to get to you because you represent the Lord. But I also think it's a dangerous thing when people latch on too tight and say, I need to get to you because, no, 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 you need to get to Jesus. And so there's this fine balance between the two, God using you and yet you becoming somebody's crutch or you becoming somebody's healing power when it's the power of God that heals a person. Let's keep reading with me. And so he says, hey, arise, make your bed. Then he arose immediately. There's a little phrase here. 
rise, take up your bed, rise, make up your bed. It literally means, hey, I want you to go and I want you to literally pack this thing up to the point where you do not expect a relapse. That's the picture here. Let me set it up more for you. It's, hey, get your bed and I want you to make up the thing. I want you to roll it up. I want you to almost, in a sense, get rid of it because you're not going to need it anymore. And I think for us, that's the picture. When we ask God to do something, we almost need to ask in a way with God. We're asking God, God, can you heal my heart? God, can you heal my marriage? God, can you touch here with this illness? What he's saying is, he's saying, take your bed to the point where you're not going to need this anymore. I think sometimes when we ask God to heal us of something, we still hold on to that one little thing just in case God doesn't heal it, right? You're like, God, I really need you to heal my heart. I really need you to, you know, get me past this. You know, somebody dumps you and you're heartbroken. You're like, God, I just really want to get past this. And yet you hold on to the little mixtape CD that they made you, you know? You hold on to just a couple pictures underneath your mattress just in case they might come back. You know, it's like God's like, no, 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 no. You're like, just in case the whole God thing doesn't work, I'm going to pop this thing in the CD player and listen to our old songs, you know, and that'll bring, no, 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 no. That's not going to bring soothing. That's not going to bring healing. It's like, get rid of the mat. God is going to heal this thing 100%. Take your mat, get rid of it. And he's saying, if you're expecting God to heal you, Take up your mat. Take up whatever it is that you cling to, that you trust in, other than what God healing you brings hope in. And he says, I want you to get rid of that. At, or John chapter 8, verse 36, it says, If the Son makes you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. And so if you have an illness, or if you smoke weed, let's say, you're not going to hold on to your pipe. You know, I, I believe God's healed me, but I'm just keeping the pipe here just in case. No, no, no. It says, you're not expecting a relapse. In a sense, for this guy, you're not expecting to go back to being paralyzed. I got rid of all the booze, but I'm going to keep the little vodka, you know, shot things and like cover. You know, no, no, no. You get rid of God, you're not going to relapse. You're healed. It's done with. It's over. And so that's really the picture as he says, hey, take up your mat and I want you to move on. Verse 35, let's finish this section. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. And so what's happening here? God not only did a work in one man's life, the man who was paralyzed, Aeneas, but he's also using the story, the testimony of Aeneas and people as a result are turning to the Lord. And so I don't want to get into it because I think we talk about it a lot. In fact, I think we talked about it a couple weeks ago. But I believe that God can use our testimony. So this is what it means. And we're going to move on. It means that if you surrender to God, it is a very unselfish thing for you to surrender to God. You know why? Because if you surrender to God, there is a possibility that your change, your story, your testimony could impact your whole home. It could impact your whole family. It could impact your workplace. No, 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 I'm just, I'm not going to surrender. I'm just going to hold on. I'm going to ask, no, I'm not going to ask the Lord to, to heal me. I'm just going to suck it up and deal with it. I mean, imagine if you come out a different person through this, people are going to notice. And that is going to make them attracted to what the Lord might want to do in their life. And so, it's a very unselfish thing for us to surrender to the Lord, who benefits us and the people around us because of the testimony it gives. And so God uses healing to get people's attention. Let's move to the next section there, verses 36 to 43. Your gift is restored. Verse 36. It says, At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman, two names, Tabitha, Dorcas. Tabitha was her Hebrew name, Dorcas was her Greek name. Same woman, same name, just one name Hebrew, the other name Greek. And so we have this, and so we see, keep reading with me in verse 36, that this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. And so now we transition, Peter makes his way, the scene now switches to about 10 miles west of Lydda into a city called Joppa. It was a port city, a very artistic city. 
And so there was a woman named Tabitha there in the church. And we're told in verse 36 that she was full of good works and charitable deeds. But I want you to notice and I want you to circle and I want you to highlight at the end of verse 36 where it says, which she did. I think this is important for us. Because I think sometimes we have good intentions. I think sometimes we have good ideas. We have good thoughts that come from a good place. But the key here is, do you carry out the good intention? Do you carry out the good thought, the whatever God lays on your heart? I think sometimes we are really good at having good thoughts. I just had this great thought. And then it passes. Opportunity passes. You know what? I see this person over here. They're kind of struggling. I got to put on my heart to go pray for them. Now put on your heart. There's a good thought. But what we're really bad at is the actual execution, isn't it? What we're really bad at is the following up on the good thought, the good intention. You know what? I saw so-and-so. They seem like they're going to kind of go going through a hard time. I'm going to go ask them if they want to have coffee this week. As you're in the midst of it, kid runs by, you chase your kid, thought's gone. And so I look at her, and for some reason, the Holy Spirit throws it in there in verse 36. Not only was she full of good works and charitable deeds, he, I don't know, I don't know if he's trying to get our attention with it or what it is, but he says, oh, by the way, she actually did them. They weren't just thoughts. She didn't just have a good heart. She really perform them she did them I love what Titus says in chapter 2 as they're exhorting the young men it says exhort the young men to be sober minded verse 7 in all things showing yourself to be a good or to be a pattern of good works and doctrine showing integrity reverence incorruptibility sound speech that cannot be condemned that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. He says, hey, I want you to take the young men, and this is what I want you to do with them. I want you to encourage them to have a pattern of good works in their life. And so I think for us as men, young men, some of us, it's good that there's a pattern. Not, not like I said, a thought of it, but a pattern of it, of good works in our life. Well, what about us ladies? Well, you have Gorgas as your example. You can go around and be little Gorgas, you know, just imitating her. This is how we do things, and this is our good pattern. And okay, so men, we have Titus. Women, you have Gorgas. And so she goes about, and they, she actually lived them out. Keep reading with me, verse 37. But it happened in those days that she, Gorgas, became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. So Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. And so get the picture here. Peter's over in Lydda. Dorcas is having this whole thing happen with her. She falls sick. She dies. I mentioned we're only talking about a 10-mile distance here between Joppa and Lydda or Lydda. And so they sent some guys. Hey, the guy, the one that they were all running to, flocking to over in Jerusalem, he's over there. He's in the next city over. And so they go, they call him, and they say, hey, can you come? There's a problem. Can you come? Now I mentioned Jesus is the one who does the healing. But I also mentioned earlier that sometimes the Lord wants to use us to be the instrument in which he does the healing. And so people will come. And I was thinking about this this morning. And I was thinking about our church. You guys remember earlier in the book of Acts where Peter and John were there? And there was that verse that said that the people could tell that they had been with Jesus. When they looked at him, they just could tell that they had been with Jesus. And I believe that the reason why they're 10 miles away and they're like, hey, we got to get over to this guy. Because they just knew that this guy had been with Jesus. And so he's the kind of guy that when stuff happens, 
when tragedy happens, when heartbreak happens, when illness happens, that's the kind of person that you look for. He was one of those Jesus kind of guys. And I think about us here this morning. Are we those Jesus kind of people? When something happens in your family, do they think about you? I know when nothing's going on and when everything's going good, you're the one that they want to stay away from. You know, you're the one that they're like, ah, don't invite him. He's going to talk about Jesus. Don't invite that one. They're going to come over. You know, Beck's going to show up with his Hillsong shirt again. You know, it's just like, uh, we already know. We know what kind of music you like. You know, you show up and it's like, okay, we, and they keep their distance. And yet the funny thing is the moment something happens, you're the first person they call. The moment somebody breaks up or dumps them, you're the one that gets the cell phone call. You're the one that gets the text. Because they know that there's something different about you. They know that you had been with Jesus. And I pray, I pray, I pray that that would be what we're known for out there. I pray that that would be what we're known for within our homes and our families. I pray that that would be what we're known for at our workplace. I pray that as you're sitting at your desk, that during lunchtime, someone would just come and say, hey, do you have a minute? That you'd be the one that they go to. Instead of, man, I don't know where I'm going to go. I'm hurting and I don't know who to turn to. And so what do they do? They turn to other stuff. They turn to vices. They turn to this addiction or go back to that thing. But instead, they have you. Because you're one of those Jesus kind of people. And I really pray that people be able to see the family resemblance with you and Jesus. Yeah, I look just, hey, they look just like Jesus. They act like Jesus. They love like Jesus. It says in verse 40, but Peter put them out. So Peter shows up. He sees all the widows. They're weeping. You know, everybody's hysterical. You know, they're, they're there with the tunics and garments that Dorcas had made. Look, she made me this blouse. You know, no, she did. You know, that kind of thing. Marcus gave me this blanket for my 20th birthday. You know, and they're, they're making this whole dramatic scene. And, and Peter puts them all out. It says he knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. And so Peter goes in. Peter says, hey, arise. He says, hey, get up. Kind of interesting. You guys remember the ruler of the synagogue that, Jesus, that came to Jesus when his daughter was dying? You know, in Mark chapter 5, as Jesus is there with the daughter, the same thing that Jesus said to the daughter, Peter's like, wait, wait, I've seen this before. I saw Jesus do this before. Let, let's try it. This is cool. This is exciting. Let's try it. You know, it's like, it worked for Jesus. Maybe it'll work for me. And so the same thing Jesus said to that daughter on that day, Peter says to Dorcas, to Tabitha, here at this moment, he says, Tabitha, rise. And she rises. And we're told there at the very end of verse 43 that in all Joppa, and all throughout Joppa, Many were believing in the Lord. And so once again, same like the last story we just took a look at, God is using a testimony of healing to bring people to the Lord. One thing I think is important before we move on into this last verse, verse 43, I want to remind you guys that Dorcas here was not resurrected. She was resuscitated. She was restored, but she was not resurrected. How do I know? Because someone who's resurrected, what happens to them? They don't die. What happens to Dorcas eventually? She dies. Just like you and I. One out of every one dies. And so this was a momentary thing. This wasn't a for life thing. This was at the moment he gives her life. He restores her. But she wasn't resurrected. I think that's one little cute little thing to throw in there. Verse 43. And we're going to finish here. It says, So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon 
a tattered. This is kind of a little thrown in there kind of verse, but I think it's really important to set the stage for where we're going to go next Sunday. We're told here at the very end, oh, by the way, after the whole gorgeous thing, he stayed in Joppa. And his, the doors were open to a home by the name of a man named the his doors are open to the home of a man. Let's try this. Let's see if it goes. A man by the name of Simon. And we're told there at the end of verse 43 that his profession was that he was a tanner. He would have done well in Venice. Well, no, 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 no. This is, that's not what he was. A tanner is literally a skinner of dead animals. And so the animals die, he goes and he gets the skin off of them. So it's not the kind of tanner that you think. Why is this important? Well, it's important because as we finish up, you guys can close your Bibles, we're done. As a good law-keeping Jew, he was forbidden to be associated with anyone who worked around dead animals. You guys remember back in the book of Leviticus, there were certain things, certain laws about being in that realm or being around that sort of scene. And so here we have Peter. The doors are open to a man who, as a profession, is around dead animals. Why is this important? Because as we get into chapter 10 next week, Peter is going to step into another house, a house where the debate between clean and unclean could possibly get in the way of a man and his family coming to know the Lord. And so what is God doing? God is preparing Peter by putting him in the tanner's home. He says, I got something going on right in front of you, but in the present, right now, I'm going to prepare you for what I have ahead. And I think that's a good word to finish up with this morning for us. That everything you go through, it's God preparing you for the next thing. And so whatever you're going through, God's like, I'm preparing you. So maybe you're here this morning, maybe you got some kind of illness and God's got you through it. What's God preparing you for? Maybe he's preparing somebody to walk through your door, walk into your life that you're going to minister who's going through the same thing. And so I look at Samantha and I'm like, I don't think what you went through, Sammy, is in vain. You know, because I believe that God's going to use what you went through the last few months in somebody else's life. And so God doesn't put it to waste. God uses it as a stepping stone of preparation for what he's going to do. So maybe your future is a bunch of sick women. Samantha, tell us again it's going to be, oh yes, you know, but God uses those things as preparation. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this moment. Lord, we thank you so much, God, for your word. And Lord, we came in this morning with just stuff and issues and drama and life, heart stuff, life stuff, sick stuff. We just came in with stuff. And we're in need of healing. So God, I pray that you this morning, as you have shown us through your word, your power to heal, God, I pray that you would just help us to leave this place in courage. Help us to walk out of this place just knowing that whatever we're going through, whatever bitterness is in our heart, whatever relationship is strained, Thank you.